You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Deanna Lee. And I'm Evan Banks. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's January 13th. Since we first launched the RAND Gun Policy in America initiative in 2018, there has been a surge in scientific research focused on firearms. This week, we published a significant update to our review of the evidence to include 29 new studies on the effects of 18 different gun laws. Among the key findings, there is now supportive evidence, that's our highest level of evidence in this project, that child access prevention laws reduce firearm homicides and self-injuries among young people. There is also supportive evidence that stand-your-ground laws and shall-issue concealed carry laws increase levels of firearm violence. Under shall-issue concealed carry laws, law enforcement officials have very limited discretion or no discretion to deny concealed carry permits to applicants who are otherwise permitted to possess handguns. Our new finding is especially notable after a Supreme Court ruling last summer made shall issue concealed carry the law of the land. States with gun policies that are not in line with this evidence should consider making changes as a strategy to reduce deaths and injuries. RAND experts will continue to review available data on the effects of America's gun laws. Their goal is to establish a shared set of facts to improve public discussions and support the development of fair and effective gun policies. To learn more about our latest findings, view our historical database of state gun laws, and more, visit www.rand.org slash gun policy. China is facing a tsunami of COVID-19 infections since it abruptly ended its strict zero-COVID policy in December. In Beijing alone, an estimated 18 million people were symptomatic by New Year's Eve, and recent reports indicate that hospitals and crematoriums are overwhelmed. Chinese scientists have predicted that there could be more than 100 million cases, 5 million hospitalizations, and 1.6 million deaths within six months of China's zero-COVID reversal. According to RAND epidemiologist Jennifer Bowie, it was a perfect storm that led to this fast and violent outbreak in China. To start, the Omicron variant is one of the most infectious viruses that has ever been recorded. At the same time, the immunity of the Chinese population is lower than that of people in the rest of the world due to two factors. One, elderly people in China were least likely to be vaccinated, and two, the low booster rate in the last six months before the end of the zero-COVID policy. In fact, more than 85 million Chinese people 60 and over failed to get vaccinated, and only half a percent of people in China received the booster. So, what could be done to address this crisis? Public health professionals understand when and how to switch from a strategy based on non-pharmaceutical interventions, like social distancing, closures, and so on, to one that relies on vaccines and pharmaceutical treatments, Bowie says. Quote, Prodding Chinese leaders, physicians, and communities towards such a policy change could be a worthy next step. As Russia's war in Ukraine grinds into its second year, some media reports and polls have suggested that the U.S. and its allies are growing tired. But just how real is Americans' Ukraine fatigue? Less than it seems, say Rand's Raphael Cohen and John Gentile. Public support for Ukraine among Americans remains relatively robust. And while there may be a partisan divide in Washington— plenty of leaders in Congress still support sending aid to Ukraine, even if they want increased oversight about how the money is spent. But the most important reason to be skeptical of Americans' supposed Ukraine fatigue is, quite simply, that there is no such thing. Quote, Americans are not, in literal fact, exhausted by this war, our experts say. To start, few Americans are actively engaged in the conflict. 
The U.S. is not suffering losses on the battlefield or enduring energy shortages. And Americans aren't paying higher taxes due to the war either. Since Congress doesn't need to balance the federal budget, aid for Ukraine isn't coming at the expense of domestic spending, at least for now. In other words, the idea of Ukraine fatigue is more myth than reality. This has important implications. Right now, Russia's strategy seems to be to let the war grind on until, eventually, the U.S. and its allies lose interest and the Ukrainians will cave. But in all likelihood, Moscow's plan won't work. And it could be years before any real declines in the American public's support for Ukraine actually result in policy changes. 2018 survey data revealed that within the previous year, over 24% of U.S. active duty women and 6% of active duty men had experienced sexual harassment. Many of these victims may also experience mental health conditions, including PTSD, depression, and substance use disorders. Despite a need to address such psychological harms, some service members report that connecting to health care or mental health services following sexual assault or sexual harassment can be difficult, in part because of a lack of leadership support. In a new study, RAND researchers examined this problem. They find that trauma-focused therapies were effective at reducing PTSD and depression symptoms among adult victims of sexual trauma in military settings. However, there is evidence of several barriers that prevent access to these therapies. These include distrust in the health system, prior negative experiences, and the perception that the predominantly male culture of military settings is unwelcome to women. There is a need for policy changes that address such issues to ensure that service members get the care that they need. Picture this. In 2050, there are mining colonies on the moon and tourist resorts floating in Earth's orbit. People are playing sports in space, generating power in space, even growing expensive, trendy coffee beans in space. This probably sounds like science fiction, but it may not be that far off from reality. Researchers at RAND Europe recently looked at how trends in more than a dozen economic sectors could play out in space between now and 2050. They found that it wouldn't take huge breakthroughs to make space and space travel a much bigger part of everyday life. In fact, if the cost to launch people and payloads into space continues to drop, it could be a game changer. Right now, it still costs thousands of dollars per kilogram to get to orbit, but that could fall to just tens of dollars by 2040, which could kick off a new era of extraterrestrial development. It could start with a race to mine precious metals from asteroids or the moon, potentially within the next decade. Any long-term mining operations would require regular transportation, supply, and repair services, And those, in turn, could also support the development of factories in outer space, where air pollution wouldn't be a concern. These enterprises would need new sources of power, which could spur the development of space-based solar farms to generate clean energy. And all of this would require more people to spend more time in outer space, potentially leading to hotels in space, new forms of transportation, even the first movies shot in space or sporting events played in space, and much more. Of course, there would be plenty of legal and regulatory questions to work out, such as who has the right to lunar resources and who has jurisdiction when a crime is committed in orbit. That's why, to help ensure a more future-proof space strategy, it's important to closely track threats and opportunities now. Brand is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. For more on today's episode, check the show notes at rand.org/podcast. We'll see you next week.